Well, a very good afternoon to you guys. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Leadership 101. My name is Kasim, and I want to firstly start off by thanking you so much for joining me. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me this afternoon, and I hope that something that I share with you today can be of some value to you and can help you to become a higher, fuller expression of who you're capable of becoming. Um, in today's episode, I want to talk to you on the subject of defining the principle of true greatness. So I want to repeat that. I want to talk to you today on the subject of defining the principle of true greatness. About six years ago, when I had a bailiff come to my mum's house and tell my mother that I was in debt, when that happened that day, I decided that I had messed up. I made a decision and I came to a realization in my life that there were some things that I didn't know. Because I thought for a very long time and for most of my life that I had, I thought I had the answers to everything. I thought I knew exactly what life should be about. I knew that you had to work hard. I knew that you had to be a good person. But what happened on that day when I had the bailiff come to my door and tell my mum that I was in debt is that I saw my mum crying and this was one of two times that I'd ever seen my mum crying. The first time that I'd ever seen my mum crying was on the day that my biological father died on his funeral. And the second time that I saw my mum crying was, of course, the day that the bailiff came to my mum's house and told my mum that I was in debt. And I'd been keeping the fact that I was in debt from my mum for about two years. So when that day happened, I was like, okay, Cass, clearly there's some things that you thought you knew that you don't know. And this led me over the last kind of six and a half years on a pursuit to basically figure out what is it that I've got wrong. Okay, I thought I knew the answers to life and I knew what you should be doing with my life and I knew what life was all about. But clearly I didn't. So what is life all about? And it led me onto this really incredible journey over the last kind of six um, six to six and a half years of trying to basically figure out what is success, what is failure, what is greatness, um, what is good, what is bad. I essentially went out to define life for myself. And in that pursuit, at the very beginning of that pursuit, I read a quote by a man called Bob Dylan that changed my life. I'm going to share it with you because I thought it was so profound. Bob Dylan said... He said this, what's money? A man is a success if he gets up in the morning, goes to bed at night, and in between does what he wants to do. You know, it's very interesting that as I've gone on this journey and this pursuit to try and figure out what life is all about and trying to figure out what is success, what is failure, on that pursuit, there are five questions which at the very beginning of this journey, I decided I wanted to know the answers to. The five questions are this. Number one, who am I? Number two, what's my story? Number three, why am I here? Number four, what can I do? And number five, where am I going? Let me repeat those five questions. I said, before I die, I want to know the answers to five questions. Number one, who am I? Who is Kasim? Number two, what's my story? Number three, why am I here? Why was I born? Why did I survive, oh, you know, almost two, two billion sperm to get here? Number four, what can I do? What is my potential? What is my capacity? And number five, I wanted to know the answer to where am I going? What does my future look like for me? What is my destiny? And in the pursuit for one of those particular question, a question of why am I here, it led me to looking at science. Because I obviously knew sort of the, uh, the philosophical ideas and the religious ideas that, you know, we were here as children of God, whatever. But I wanted to look at some data and I wanted to understand from a scientific point of view, why did human beings exist? And so what I found essentially was that there are two 
scientific reasons that I could find at the very beginning of my journey that essentially human beings, why human beings exist. Those two reasons are number one, that human beings exist in part to live. Um, we want to survive. And in fact, it's not just human beings. This is actually every species on the planet. Every species on this planet strives to live for as long as possible. Human beings especially do remarkable things and, uh, and, and, and fascinating things to prolong their life. Um, you know, for the last decade, over a decade now, I've worked in the hospitality industry. Um, and for the last kind of three years, I've worked in the retail industry. And in that, I've worked in places like Co-op, the Cooperative, and in Tesco's. And it has been absolutely fascinating for me to observe the lengths that people are prepared to go to to basically preserve their life to look younger, to look more youthful, to feel better vitality. I mean, I did some research and I found that the cosmetic sector in the UK is around 9.8 billion pounds, right? Now, if the cosmetic sector was, let's say, you know, 100 million, we could say, do you know what? Fair enough, you know, people. But when you're talking about a, an industry which every year people are spending close in the UK alone, I mean, we're not even talking worldwide, we're not even talking Europe. This is just the UK that people are spending almost 9.8 billion pounds to look good, to look younger. That tells you the degree to what people as human beings were prepared to to preserve our life. In fact, if you look at where even if you go to the most basic things and you look at where people live, why do people want to live in safe, safe neighborhoods? Why do people want to live in a really wealthy area? If you follow that back down to its core, then you will find that at the center of it is the preservation of life. We want to live for as long as possible. The second reason that I found why human beings uh, uh, what I guess at the scientific level human beings are trying it's all about and which, why we're on this planet is that I found that we wish to multiply but again this principle of, of, of life isn't just on the human side it is actually occupied by every organism on this planet every organism on the planet Mold seeks to multiply. For example, if you've had a family member in your family have cancer, you will know that when they get when a, 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 a cancer cell attacks a, when a cancer attacks a cell, that it doesn't just the, the tumor doesn't just play, stay in one place. It begins to multiply and it begins to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually, of course, it starts taking over, the cancer starts taking over somebody's brain or somebody's organs. And in some cases, it takes over their entire body and shuts down their, their entire body to the point where, of course, their physical presence is ended on the planet, right? And as I look at human beings, I begin to see that human beings as well, we like to multiply, we desire to have children, we deserve to pass on knowledge, right? So those are the two reasons that I found that human beings essentially are looking, is, is really the reason at the very core from a scientific point of view as to why human beings, we want to live for us, uh, as long as possible. But here's where it gets interesting. On the multiplication side of things, human beings have something which is very unique to us that as a species do not possess. You see, every if you look at a tree, a tree will grow as tall as a tree could possibly grow. Um, if you look at a polar bear, a polar bear will try to gather and eat as much as possible and preserve its life for as long as possible. Did you know that human beings are the only living organism who have the ability to commit suicide, to end their life prior to, it, to its natural, uh, natural progression? 
And the reason why that is, is because human beings have been given the dignity of choice. We don't have to live to the max of our potential. Human beings do not have to um, go out there and do the best that they can, right? Nobody, the, the, the English law does, and constitution does not govern and mandate that you have to become everything that you're capable of becoming. That is just not something that the English government mandates or requires you to do. In fact, I say to people all the time that if you look at the English in, in the UK, and, and I'm generalizing here, there's essentially two things that really society expects of you. Number one, they expect you to pay your taxes. Everyone expects people to pay their taxes, right? It's unfair that I pay my taxes and you don't pay your taxes. And in fact, it, in fact, the government are so strict on this that they even take the taxes before you can even access the money. Because they know that people will try to evade paying the taxes, so they take it before you even get your wages. The second um, thing that I, I've seen that essentially people expect from people is do not stop anybody else from getting what they want, and more specifically, at the cost of their life. In other words, if you try to commit a crime, if you steal something from somebody that does not belong to you, if you kill another human beings, another human being, we in the UK do not like that. We do not condone that. And as a result, of course, we know we'll send you to prison, right? And all kinds of things will happen to your, to your life. So those are really the two things that people expect of you. Nobody really expects anything of anyone be kind of beyond that. Now, obviously saying that your parents might want to expect you to be successful or want you to do the best that you can or to be kind, but those are not laws. They cannot enforce them on you. So that tells us something. Because as I look around at the world, I've been pushed into a position that I never wanted to get into, which is really talking about leadership. I never wanted to talk about leadership. I wanted never to really teach about leadership. In fact, I never even wanted to step into the light. I never wanted to step into the spotlight to talk about this stuff. Many people, it's funny, because many people think that as Kasim, I somewhat desire um, to be famous. I desire to be in the public eye. That I desire to be the center of attention. It's, it's, it's always quite funny for me, because I am the opposite of that. I would much rather be by myself than be with other people. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, I love being with other people and having a good time. But I love being in my own company. I have no problem at all, at all, being alone. And the issue that I've got is that there are so many people who I look at, and even you yourself, there are a lot of people who you know in your life who have the capacity for greatness who have the capacity for leadership, who have the capacity to do the most amazing things with their lives, and yet they're not doing them. And my question has been, why? Why have we got so many men, so many individuals, right, who have the capacity for greatness, who have the capacity for love, who have the capacity for truth, who have the capacity for leadership, who have the capacity to defend, to build, to create. Why are so many men not doing so? And I found that part of the reason why is because a lot of men don't know what greatness is. A lot of men don't even consider that greatness is something which they should pursue. You know, I've, I've said for a long time, and I'll repeat it again today, that one of the big realizations in my life was the day that I realized where the wealthiest place on the planet was. For a long time, I thought that the wealthiest place on the planet was like Saudi Arabia. Um, I thought that maybe it's the oil fields of Iraq or Iran. At other times, I thought it was the diamond mines of South, South America. But you know what I discovered? That all of those places are not the wealthiest places. The wealthiest place on this planet is a graveyard. Because in, because in the graveyard you find people with dreams that they never fulfilled. Businesses that they never started. The causes which they never went to fight, to pursue, to defend. 
to conquer. All of that wealth is taken to the graveyard by people who you know and people who you've heard of. And I ask myself, what is that stuff that people take to the graveyard? Do you know what that is called? Potential. All of that wealth that people take with them when they die is called potential. Potential is what I want to essentially get you to pursue in this video. Because what I've come to realize is a lot of people do not fulfill their potential. People do not feel fulfilled. Full field, full field. People don't feel as if they're full, right? Because they're not fulfilling their potential, because they're not going pu pushing to the edges of their capacity. And I wanted in today's video to really talk about um, defining success, defining greatness. I really wanted to define what greatness is for you. And I wanted to share with you three different um, definitions of success, which I think should be useful for you. And I'm only sharing these with you because they were so useful in my own life. And I thought perhaps that they might add some value to your life and might be perhaps be of some use to helping you to becoming a higher, fuller expression of yourself. By the way, as I was um, sort of preparing for today, one of the things that I was thinking about is that I was thinking about what I call the highest act of manhood, right? I wanted to ask, my, uh, there was a question that I was really thinking about, and the question that I was thinking about was, what are the highest acts? What does it mean to be truly a man, right? And what I discovered was that there were a number of things that if you do, or you become, or you fulfill, you move over from adolescence to manhood. And let me give you a couple of those. Number one, taking full responsibility for your life. Jim Rohn once said that the, uh, the day that you move from childhood to adulthood is a day that you take full responsibility for your life. Here's another one. The day that you move from experimenting and living and instead move over to living by principles and a code. A lot of guys don't have a code. A lot of guys don't have principles. I know what you will do to become successful. I know what you will do for love. I know what you will do for your family. My question to you is, what will you not do? What will you not do? What would you be prepared to die for because you believe in it so much? Because I meet a lot of people who say, Kasim, I will do, I will work 80 hours to become successful. I will work hard. You should forgive people. But my question to you is, what would you not do? Here's another one of those days. The day that you move into one of the highest acts of manhood is the day that you start mentoring. The day that you start finding young people, somebody who's behind you, and start saying, let me show you the way. Let me show you how to improve your life. Let me show you how to become better at sales. Let me show you how to reach the highest capacity of what it means to be you, of what your truth is. Let me help you to discover the best version of yourself and how you can live the best life for you. A lot of men never get to that point in their life where they start helping somebody who's behind them to become a higher, fuller expression of themselves. The last one that I want to leave you with is this one. The day that you reach one of the highest levels of manhood is a day that you move away from just helping your family to helping other families. See, I hear a lot of guys say, well, Kasim, I'll do anything for my family. I'll die for my family. Wonderful. But that's expected. You see, I don't consider you doing anything for your family. Um, I don't consider that as greatness. Greatness is when you decide that you're going to go beyond your own family and go to your neighbours and go to your community and go to your city and go to the world. That's when you start reaching those highers, higher levels of greatness, higher levels of manhood. And I would ask you to consider yourself, ask yourself and consider for yourself whether any of those apply to you. 
Would somebody say that you take full responsibility for everything in your life? Would somebody say that you live by a code, you live by principles, that you don't experiment, that you take advice, that you've got a, 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 a country of people around you, an abundance of people around you who are feeding into your life, who are sharing ideas, who are getting you to question yourself. Ask yourself if you have somebody behind you who you're mentoring, who you're helping, not in your own family, but beyond your own family, who you're helping to become a higher, fuller expression of who they're capable of becoming. Ask yourself, are you the kind of male, are you the kind of man who is gone beyond your own family and is helping other people's families, helping other people to become who they are capable of becoming, helping other people realize who they are capable of um, uh, becoming. Because if you're not doing that, my question to you is, what are you doing? Because I think you can agree with me that you have the capacity to do it. You have the ability. I mean, if you live in the UK, you literally have the full resources of what it means to live in the UK at your disposal. My question is, are you exercising them? Because remember what I said to you earlier on, the only species on this planet that does not operate by an instinctive code is us. Humans are the only species on this planet where we have the ability to make choices. You know, I was having a conversation with a guy yesterday and he said to me, you know, I was saying to him, you know, you should do something to do with teaching or you should do something to do with helping other people because you're very knowledgeable about different topics and you're very knowledgeable about relationships. And I said, you should help other people. And he said, Kasim, you know, I can't do that. And I said, why not? And he said, because I'm selfish. You know, I, like if, if somebody comes to me and they tell me about their problems, I'm not, I'll tell them, I don't care, I'm not interested. And I said to him, that's okay. You can change. That's okay. You don't have to like it. You can literally decide today that that was the way that you've been all your life. But from today, you're going to decide to now not be selfish anymore. And he looked at me in absolute horror because he was like, what do you mean by that? And I said, it literally is a choice. You can literally decide today to say, you know what? I don't really, I, you know, I'm wise enough to get that just trying to get things for myself cannot lead to their higher states of being. That nobody has ever got to the end of their life and they've said, do you know what? The reason why I was successful and the reason why I had a remarkable life was because I only looked after myself, was because I did not look out for anybody else. We've never heard books that have been written. We've never heard stories of people who are successful and who have lived abundant lives and who have achieved greatness who've said that. And I can share with you that if you so desire it, you can actually right now, even though you're not reaching your potential, even though you're not exercising your capacity, you could from today decide, you know what? I'm actually going to go and help mentor young people. I'm actually going to start living by a code. I'm actually going to start taking full responsibility for my life. You literally can decide now and start moving forward. I love what Jim Rohn said. Jim Rohn once said that you cannot change destination overnight, but you can change direction. I repeat, he said you cannot change destination overnight, but you can change direction. Something for you to think about. So let me firstly begin off with the first definition of success, uh, of greatness that I wanted to share with you that I found so useful. And it came from Will Smith. Will Smith said this, he said, greatness is, this, is not this wonderful, esoteric, elusive, godlike feature that only the special manga among us will ever taste. It's something that truly exists in all of us. Let me repeat what he said. He said that greatness is not this wonderful, esoteric, elusive, godlike feature that only the special among us will ever taste is something that truly exists in all of us. And before I share this with, the, before I go into that statement, one of the things that I wanted to share with you, which I think is really important, is this. If you don't know what something looks like, you can't tell it when you see it. Let me, let me repeat that. If you don't know what something is, 
you cannot tell it when you see it. And the reason why I'm saying this statement to you before I begin this is because there's going to be a lot of you guys who think that to really live a remarkable life means looking out for yourself. Many of you think you know what greatness is, but do you know what I've come to find? To find, unless you you've you've seen an opposition, unless you've seen contrast to something, you wouldn't know what truly something is. Let me put it like this: you wouldn't know what good is unless you've seen bad. You wouldn't know what bad is unless you've seen good. Let me take this further. So. Um, I come from Uganda, as many of you will know, and one of the things that I've been absolutely fascinated with recently from my country is that the current president of my country, um, a guy called President Museveni, has been in power for the last 37 years. Okay, 37 years is one of the longest periods ever for a president to hold office. And um, and the our president of Uganda... Um, President Museveni changed the constitution twice in order to stay in power and one of the questions I was asking myself is how can this be because I couldn't understand how somebody could stay in power and somebody could spend their entire could live in a country where somebody would change a constitution to stay in power here's what I discovered because they don't know anything else if you don't know, if you were born into, uh, 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 let's say you were born 37 years ago and the only president that you've ever known is Museveni, you wouldn't even know what true leadership is unless somebody else comes along and shows you a different way. You wouldn't even know. L do you know what? Let me tell you a story. And I wasn't even going to tell you this, but I love this story so much because it illustrates the point that I want to get across to you. Um, there are these two fish which are swimming along. The story goes like this. There are these two fish which are swimming along. Young fish. They're having banter. They're having a good time. They're having jokes. They're swimming along. As they're swimming along, in the opposite direction, there is another fish, an older fish, sing, swimming towards them. As the older fish is swimming towards them, the lads continue having banter, etc., etc. And as the, the, the fish drew, draw closer together, the older fish says to the young fish, Good morning, boys. How is the water this morning? The young fish look at the old fish, a uh, bit puzzled and like kind of, what a weird old man. And uh, guys, go with the story. Clearly, this is a metaphor. I know fish don't talk. Just go with it. And they, and, and they look at the old man as if he's really weird. And the old man looks at them and he kind of carries on swimming and they carry on swimming. A little while later on, one of the younger fish looks at his mate and his mate looks confused. And so he says to his mate, what's wrong, mate? And his mate says, nothing, man, nothing, no nothing's wrong. He says, well, I can tell something is wrong. What, what's the issue? Come on, man, talk to me. Talk to me. Well, what's going on? And his mate says to him, what the hell is water? The point of that parable or story is that if you've been in water your entire life, you wouldn't know any different. The only time that you would know that you're in water is if somebody once came along and pointed it to you. And this is essentially why I told you that I am reluctant. I was reluctant. I didn't even want to do this leadership. I didn't even want to do these videos. The only reason why I'm doing them is because I've come to realize that many individuals are living, but they don't realize that they have the capacity for more. They don't even realize that they have greatness. They don't even realize that they have the ability to do the most remarkable things. Many, many, many people, guys, specifically males in the UK, are living their life thinking that they're doing amazing. They think that they're pushing right to the edges of their capacity. But if their capacity is a 10, they're operating at a 4 and they think that they're doing well. Let me take this further. Imagine... If you have a, a car and your car has the ability to do 100 miles per hour, but you've been driving your car at 40 miles an hour your entire life. Now, if I come along in the same car as you and drive past you at 80 miles an hour, guess what you will say? 
Wow, there's something special about me. There's something unique about me. There's something, you know, I've cheated. Do you know what? I'm, I can't be trusted. What I'm trying to say to you is this. Most people, until someone comes along and actually says to you that you have greatness, which is why I'm coming to you and saying to you that you have greatness and you have the capacity to do it, you wouldn't even know what greatness is. You wouldn't even know how to define it. You wouldn't even know that you're living below your potential. And that's something which I would encourage you to recognize in your own life. Are you really living to your potential? And my question further still is, if, you're, if you have a car that has the ability to drive 100 miles an hour, you've been driving yours at 50 and everybody else has been driving theirs at 20, you've actually been doing amazing. You're actually more successful than other people. But are you successful? Because if you have the ability to drive up to 100 miles an hour, but you're only driving at 50, and you're comparing yourself against people driving at 20 and looking good because you're driving at 50, does that mean you're successful? I don't know. I would just ask you to really look at that because how can you be successful when you have the capacity to drive at 100 but you don't and when you compare yourself to other people who are driving at 20, you're doing amazing? Something for you to think about. Now let's go back to what Will Smith said. Will Smith said that greatness is not this wonderful, esoteric, elusive, godlike feature that only the special among us will ever possess is something that truly exists in all of us. So let's break this down into two things. Firstly, let's look at the, what he said. He said that greatness is not this wonderful, esoteric, elusive, godlike feature. Now, I asked myself, why would Will Smith say that greatness is not this esoteric, elusive, godlike feature? And what I began to realize was that many people actually believe that greatness is something which is for other people. They believe that greatness is something which they do, is not reserved to them. They believe that one person can't really make a big difference in the world. One person cannot really change, uh, change the world. Come on, I mean, let's be realistic, right? You know, there was a speech which I once read about three years ago called The Ripple of... Um, the day, in fact, it came from what is called the Day of Affirmation, which John F. Kennedy said at the University of Cape Town in South Africa um, in June of 1966. And in this speech, he said something that I want to read to you because I found it so profound and so interesting. He said this, First is the danger of fertility. The belief that there is nothing that one man or woman can do against the, array, the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery, against ignorance, or injustice and violence. Yet many of the world's, the world's greatest movements of thought and action have flowed from the work of a single man. A young monk began the Protestant Reformation. A young general extended an empire from Macedonia to the borders of the earth, and a young woman reclaimed the territory of France. It was a young explorer who discovered the New World, and a 32-year-old Thomas Jefferson who proclaimed that all men are created equal. Give me a place to stand, said Archimedes, and I will move the world. These men move the world, and so can we all. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of the events, and in the total of all those acts will be written in the history of this generation. What I'm trying to share with you, and is what was shared by J.F. Kennedy, is that you need to develop the philosophy if you truly want to live up to your potential and you truly want to achieve greatness in your life. The philosophy that the Buddha had, which is that every day good men have to wake up and try to empty the ocean with a spoon. You see, most people do not really see their actions as momentum. They don't see them as steps 
moving forward. They don't see their contribution. They cannot see their significance. And this really is at the core of what it means to achieve greatness. Because when you start realizing that you have something to offer this planet, that there is something special about you, there is something unique about you that this planet can benefit from, all of a sudden things begin to change in your life. All of a sudden you have the ability to realize that actually your efforts do matter and that your efforts do count. And I'm wondering to myself what your belief is. Do you believe that greatness is for other people or do you believe that is something that you can achieve? Are you somebody who in, sp in spite all of the different obstacles that can stand in your way, you still believe that you can make some kind of progress, that you have the philosophy that Steve Jobs had for Apple, which is to make a dent in the universe. Something for you to think about. Now, Will Smith once again said that is something which truly exists is in all of us. That means that the greatness is not outside of yourself. In other words, what Will Smith is saying is the accumulation of money, of wealth, of possessions, of houses, does not make you great. Fame cannot make you great. The greatness is inside of you. As you become more of yourself, you realize the greatness. Greatness isn't so much about doing, but greatness is more about becoming. What do I mean by that? A lot of people tend to think that in order to become great, you've got to do something. I disagree, because actually, if you look at history and you look at people who've become, who we consider to be great, so the likes of people like Nelson Mandela, Mary Curie, Mother Teresa, the likes of um, individuals like um, Lucky Dube, these individuals were what I call reluctant leaders. These individuals didn't even want power. They didn't want fame. They didn't want to um, stand in the crowd. They wanted to be in the spotlight. You know, it, one of the things that's really interesting is I was doing some research um, on Africa. And I, I found it absolutely fascinating that the, uh, Nelson Mandela is one of the only leaders who stayed one term in office in South Africa. This man went to prison for something he believed in, had the opportunity to become president, and do you know what he did? He gave it up after one term. He didn't even want the power. And yet, we remember him. Now, if I asked you to tell me what three presidents of South Africa have been, you probably couldn't name one. So my question is, why do we all remember Nelson Mandela? Why? It, let me take this further. I was looking at uh, some further research, and I found, <laughs> and you're not going to believe this, the average mayor, the average president of Africa stays in power for over 10 years. Now, that's insane, right? So you, now you've got to start asking questions. How can somebody who's we remember throughout the world, who everybody knows his name, get the opportunity to get into power, and after one term he refuses it, and yet there are other people who have loads of presidents in Africa who none of us know their names, and yet they want to stay in power forever. In fact, the guy who is currently the president of Uganda has been in power for 37 years. He changed the constitution twice because in Uganda you were not allowed to be um, the president for more than two terms. He changed the constitution so that he could stay in power more. See, people who achieve greatness understand that greatness isn't about power. Greatness isn't about manipulation. Greatness isn't about abuse. Greatness is about empowerment. Greatness is about freedom. Greatness is about helping people to rise beyond where they are. It is about serving other people. It is about helping other people become great. And I would ask you to think about that in your own life. 
Are you somebody who wants power? You want more. You want more money. You want a bigger house. You want to, you want to live in a better neighborhood. L listen to me. That doesn't, just because you want those things, it doesn't mean that you're bad. But my question to you is, what is your intention behind that? Why do you want a bigger house? Why do you, even though you're earning a lot of money in comparison to the most of the world, and we know that most of the world lives on two pounds a day, and you're living on 30 pounds a day, so you, uh, you know, you're, Almost, you know, 20 God knows how many times and uh, you, you have more on a daily basis. You have somewhat 20 more times more money than most of the world. Why is it that you still are pursuing more and you're still never satisfied? What will fulfill you? Because I have found that to reach fulfillment, you're going to have to help other people. In fact, this leads me to something that I absolutely love um, because the second definition of success that I want to share with you is this. It was given by Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar said that if you will help enough people get what they want, you can have everything that you want. Let me repeat that. Zig Ziglar said that if you want to achieve greatness, help enough... If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything that you want. Now, I know a lot of you are listening to me right now when you're saying, well, that's bullshit, Kasim. What do you mean help enough people get what they want? I haven't even got anything. I have no money. I don't have any power. I have nothing to give anyone. So let me now share with you another version of this statement and another version of this philosophy that should help you. Many years ago, a great question was asked. The question said, how can we achieve greatness? How can we achieve great power, great influence? How can we make a great contribution? How can we be remembered throughout the ages, throughout history? How can we have safety? How can we have abundance in our lives? That was a question. How can we achieve that? Here was the answer. And I want you to pay attention to the answer. The answer was this. Find a way to serve the many, for service to many will lead to greatness. I'm going to repeat it. The answer to how somebody can achieve greatness, great power, great influence, great abundance, great happiness, great joy in their life, was find a way to serve the many, for service to many will lead to greatness. This tells us something. You have to find a way. Because a lot of people will say, well, Cass, you know, I, I, I don't really have anything. I can't give anything. I'm just struggling myself. The key to it is to find a way. A lot of people will say, I don't have a way and do nothing and stop there. The people who achieve greatness in their lives realize. You see, the whole point is potential has to be broken open. Like, a bit like an egg. To realize the potential of an egg. You can look at an, a, an egg and think that is all his potential. But to really see what an egg can do, you have to break it open. And so what I'm sharing with you is this, to reach your potential, to feel fulfilled, to reach the highest levels of manhood, you're gonna have to come out of your comfort zone. You're gonna have to do things which are different. You're going to have to explore everything that you have to offer. You know, so many of us, we get attached to who we are, where we've been, what we've been doing. And if you look at people who've achieved greatness, many of them, and now I'm about to give you a, a principle of success, many of them apply, part of the reason why they became great is because they applied the principle of success, which I want to share with you. That principle of success is sacrifice. All of you who are listening to me will know that if you wish to become successful, there is a certain level of sacrifice that has to be given. Whether that be a lifestyle, it be time, it be joy in, in entertainment, there is certain things that you have to give up. And uh, do you know what? Whilst we're on this, let me share something with you which I found to be really interesting. There is something, um, uh, sort of a philosophy that I don't know whether you've heard of, called enlightened self-interest. I don't know whether you've heard of it. 
Um, enlightened self-interest is a philosophy that says that a person who acts to further their interest, that a person who acts to further the interest of others or a group in which they belong, ultimately ends up serving themselves. Let me repeat that. So enlightened self-interest is a philosophical concept that says that if an individual ends up helping other people, inadvertently they will actually end up helping themselves. So let, let's use an example. Let's say, do you know what, Ka you say, Kasim, do you know what, I want to make money. I want to make money, okay? I need money. In order to go on holiday, I need money to pay for the holiday. And you apply what I said earlier on, which is you want to... You, it, also, you want to achieve greatness and you understand that to achieve greatness, you've got to find a way to serve the many. And you find a way and you find a group of people who you want to serve. OK, you and then you find that actually they have a problem and you can solve that problem. And the problem that they have is that a lot of people want to own a BMW uh, in a specific 1930s era but they can never gain access to these private auctions where they can never get it. So a normal person can never get it. And you think, actually, you know what? I've been working in this industry. Um, I know a lot about people who have these cars. I know where people can get them. I'm going to be an intermediary. So I'm going to try to link. I'm going to set up a business where I try to link people who are just average people and are not super wealthy right? And I'm going to link them with people who I've known who have similar cars. I'm going to use my contacts. You use that to set up a business and years later you become successful. Now, here's what happened. Initially, when you first started off, it was all about helping other people. And really, at the beginning, as you started the, the company, you didn't really make any money and there was nothing in it for you. But because you applied that principle of enlightened self-interest, all of a sudden, years later, you now are getting something which is a product of your sowing, is a product of what you've given to other people, of you finding a way to help other people. There is a statement that I have heard many times said by successful people, which is that people are rewarded in public for what they've practiced for years in private. I love it when I hear people say that, oh, they, that person's an overnight success. Overnight successes took usually 10, 15, 20, 30 years for that person to become an overnight success. In fact, you will tend to find that people who achieve greatness, and I said to you earlier on that sacrifice is part of this, to, uh, that a principle of success is uh, sacrifice, you will tend to find that a lot of people who achieve success are long-term thinkers. These individuals have a long-term perspective. They're willing to sacrifice instant gratification of having something good and are willing to wait for something greater, something better, something phenomenal, something amazing. My question to you is, are you prepared to give up something good for something greater? Are you prepared to give up something, a life right now, which is okay for something which could be spectacular? Because a lot of you lads aren't prepared to do that. This is part of the reason why I wanted to do this, because you actually think that you're doing well because, you, I mean, you and your missus and your family, you're taken care of. So you think that that is the highest level of what it means to be a man. I disagree. What I'm sharing with you is that actually the highest level of what it means to be a human being, of achieving greatness. Success is one level, then above success, now you're getting to greatness. Success is looking after yourself and achieving and having competence and getting what you want. Greatness is helping other people achieve what you've achieved. My question to you is, how many people have you, are you helping at the moment achieve what you've achieved? How many people at the moment are you helping free? How many people at the moment are you helping liberate? How many people at the moment are you helping to rise beyond where they've been, beyond their meager beginnings? How many people? Because if the answer to that is none, that's a problem. That tells us something about the philosophy that you occupy currently. I don't know. It's just, I'm, these are just things for you to think about. Things for you to think about. 
The last statement that I wanted to share with you and the last definition of greatness uh, that I wanted to share with you is it, it, was, it, it was a statement and a definition which was given by William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare said that, be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. You know, let's firstly look at this first statement that I've, as I listened to this statement and I read that statement, I was curious. I said, why would William Shakespeare start off with, do not be afraid? And I discovered that To become great requires that you realize that you have greatness. To become great mandates that you take the advice of Michael Jackson, which is that you look at the man in the mirror. And when you look at the man in the mirror and you get to the point in your life where you have gone past all the bullshit of you're not great, you'll never be enough, you can't do anything. And you genuinely get to the point where you're like, do you know what? My life is significant. Do you know what? I could do something with this. Do you know what? I can help people. When you get to the point where you have that philosophy, it's a very scary place to be. Because when you get to that, one of the things that you're going to have to do is that you're going to have to do things that conflict with the majority of the world. Let me share with you a principle of life that I have learnt and has really been very useful for me. All good will be attacked. That's the philosophy and the statement that I've learned. This, this has been major for me. All good will be attacked. You see, I always used to think, do you know what, if you're a good person and you're doing a good thing and you want to help people and your intentions are right and you want, to, you want to do good in the world, I always used to think everybody would support you. Everybody would be behind you. Everybody would rally behind you. No. In fact, the greater the thing that you're trying to do or the intention behind it, the bigger it is, the bigger the resistance you're going to have. The more people are going to hate you the more people are going to resist what you are saying. Um, so I've talked a lot about Uganda because I, it's just something that I've been thinking a lot about recently. But let me take this and go on a bit further about Uganda. So many of you, as you've heard me say today, Uganda has had the same president for the last 37 years. And a bit like a lot of Africa, people, are, the younger generation especially, have had access to the internet which a lot of other generations beforehand have not so I, I said to you that you don't know what something is unless you've been offered no sorry you you wouldn't know what something looks like unless you've been offered something different and a lot of generations before this current generation in Africa, in a lot of the African countries, had no access to the internet. They had no knowledge. They didn't know what actually existed beyond Africa. They didn't know what other leaders were like. They didn't know what other presidents in other countries were like. And as you should know, a lot of African countries have, especially the government, has hold of the publications of all of the news and media. So they have the ability to filter through what people have access to. But now, because of the internet, people can gain access to information which they've not been able to gain access to. And of course, people have started to look at the West and they're like, hold on a minute. In the US, they have presidents that change every four years. Why have we had a president for the last 37 years? And so a lot of the African countries, there's been a lot of disturbances. There's been a lot of rioting. There's been a lot of um, uh, the young people kind of challenging the status quo. And in Uganda, there is a man called Bobby Wine, who is a young guy, you know, a guy in his 30s. He's 37 years of age. And 37 years of age is a young age for somebody to wish to become a president of a country. And because of him desiring to do this, to challenge okay, the opposition, to challenge a president which has been in power for 37 years, <laughs> he, 
He, his life is on the line. He's been tried, he's tried to be assassinated. What I'm saying to you is, you would think if you're a young pe person and, 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 and somebody wants to do great and they want to free a country and they want to liberate people and they want to build schools and they want to build infrastructure, everybody would support them. No. Because one of the things, you know, I was talking to my friend about this and I was saying one of the reasons why Africa remains the way Africa in poverty and the way it is, is for two major reasons. One is because of um, education, right? If you give an African, let's say, £100,000, you know what's going to happen within two years. He's going to have lost the money. He's going to have used it on gambling, on buying things that aren't good. He wouldn't know what to do with that kind of money. He doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't know how to what, how a pension fund would work like. He doesn't know what how what interest how interest works. He doesn't understand what passive income is. So that knowledge isn't there. So a lot of Africans, it's not that people Africans don't are, are dumb. It's just they don't have the information to be able to rise above where they are. The second thing that Africa struggles a lot with is um, infrastructure and logistics, right? This is a major problem for Africa. No matter how good you want to do stuff, the issue is Africa just doesn't have an infrastructure and logistics. It doesn't. A lot of places don't have running water, toilets, roads. Uh, electricity, Wi-Fi. I mean, if you live in the UK, these are basic things. But in Africa, most of Africa doesn't have these kinds of things, right? In the in the in the Western world, these are like must. If you go somewhere and there's no like Wi-Fi, you think well, how weird. You go somewhere and there's no lighting, there's no real roads. You think how weird is this place? But in a lot of Africa, that's the way things are. But I want to add one further thing, which is one of the main reasons why a lot of Africa stays the way it is. Corruption. Corruption is one of the biggest reasons why Africa remains the way it is. Afri As most of you know, most governments are, most of the world operates on systems, right? There's systems in the government. The issue is when somebody comes along and challenges the system, everybody who is in the system is exposed. So a lot of people see that there is wrong with the Ugandan government and the schools are not being built and the kids are not being educated and there's poverty and there's no infrastructure and there's no logistics. The issue is, if somebody steps out of that and backs Bobby Wine and backs this new young person, the entire domino would fall. So he is getting opposition from people who know that the system doesn't work. But they have to continue it going because if they step out of it, the domino starts to fall. It weakens. And of course, because of corruption, you can just buy everyone <laughs> these days, right? Not even these days. It's always been like that. So what I'm trying to say to you is this. A lot of you guys, in order to reach greatness, you're going to leave, have to leave the life that you've known is your normal life behind. You're going to have to leave what is safe behind. You're going to have to leave your comfort zone behind. You're going to have to explore all the different aspects of who you are in order to fulfill your potential, in order to grow, in order to create, in order to manifest the greatness that is inside of you. You're going to have to really experiment and pull yourself apart. The other thing, and is the last thing that I want to share with you today, is... William Shakespeare then said that some men achieve greatness, others have greatness thrust upon them, and some are indeed born great. So some men are born great, some achieve greatness, and others have greatness thrust upon them. The reality is that for most people who are going to listen to this, greatness, you're not born into greatness. You're not a president. You're not born to uh, the president of a country. You're not the CEO. You're not born to a CEO of a company, right? You're not born to become some kind of uh, mayor or someone like that, right? Or member of parliament or lord. That's not something that you're born into. Most of the people who are listening to me, you're not going to have th greatness thrust upon you. It's a reality. Which leaves you with one. You're going to have to make the decision to do it. 
I said to you at the very beginning of today that the thing that divides human beings from all other living organisms on this planet is choice. Human beings do not operate by instinctive code. Trees have to grow as tall as trees can grow. Trees, you've never once heard of a tree say, do you know what, I'm going to grow half. I don't really want to grow as much. I don't want to really produce as much fruit as I can. No, trees will try to produce as much trees, as much fruit as they can. Right? You've, but human beings, we don't have to do that. We can literally say, I don't, I'm not trying. I'm not going to help anybody. You, you, we have the dignity of being able to do that. And so what I'm saying to you is, the world doesn't really expect very much from you. Your potential, if you don't use it, is just going to is just going to enrich the graveyard even further so you weren't born into greatness where you have no choice but to rise up to becoming the president or becoming a lord or whatever it means you're going to have to make this choice alone the choice to rise beyond your own family and help other people is going to have to be yours the choice to reach the full capacity of what it means to be a human being it's going to be a choice that you're going to have to make. Nobody's going to push you. The government does not require you to fulfill your potential. This is not a requirement in the UK. Your parents even just want you to be successful and happy. They themselves do not make it. They are not going to force you to reach your potential. It is something that has to come out of you. It is a decision that you will have to make yourself. And I challenge you... To really think about this this week, whether you're going for success or you're going for greatness, success is helping yourself become get what you want. Greatness is helping other people get what they want. My question to you is, have you found a way to help other people? Because remember, remember what the question said, the answer to the question was, if you want to have great power, great influence, greatness, find a way. Are you trying to find different ways to help other people to get what they want? And that right there is where I want to leave it. Um, I don't know whether this has been useful for you or not, but I really, really, really encourage you to really look at that, guys. Look at your potential. Look at if you're really exercising your greatness. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.